Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's a really great pleasure and honor to be here today. First of all, I would like to thank the Fiopera Alliance uh, uh, for the invitation, also for a very nice uh, introduction uh, that I received from uh, Matt. And also, I would like to thank the uh, board of the Fiopera Alliance, as well as Stephanie. I have to say that uh, I've been in contact with Stephanie, uh, I would say, for the last um, uh, six weeks or eight weeks, but I am very uh, much amazed because it's wonderful uh, uh, interaction and uh, sometimes I have uh, some very interesting, maybe sometimes odd judgments, you know, so how I approach certain people and I have to say that uh, whenever I send a message to Stephanie, whether it's uh, Friday morning, Friday evening or over the weekend, uh, she responds. So it tells me something uh, uh, something that is very promising, and I'm pretty sure that under her leadership, uh, the Fiopara Alliance will do a lot of uh, great things. Uh, and what was mentioned also, it's important that uh, uh, there are only few m members of the, the board for Fiopara Alliance, and I think, and I mentioned it yesterday as well, uh, if uh, we don't uh, work together and united our forces, and I'm not talking only about the physicians, but I'm talking about the patients, uh, uh, it's very important because you have something which is extremely, extremely rare, and um, if you take care of yourself, uh, which means that you will work together, you will interact together, and you will uh, work together, of course, uh, with Fiopera Alliance. Uh, I think that we can move uh, the, the, not only the diagnosis, which I think that it's pretty good, but uh, uh, mainly the treatment of uh, Pheochromocytoma paraganglioma and especially uh, metastatic disease uh, further. And I can tell you it's not very easy because there are only very, very, very few groups uh, and um, uh, maybe even fewer groups uh, in United States um, than, for example, in Europe. Mm, and to go through some clinical trials is absolutely complicated, difficult, uh, sometimes very cumbersome, but it can be done. And uh, I think that this is something that we have to do because uh, finally we would like uh, to have our patients to be treated, to be returned to their families, and it's also for your children. And it is very important. So we, we are not thinking about only about ourselves, but about our uh, children. And many of you who are sitting here have uh, your children who are carriers of the mutation, whether it's a mutation that uh, and I mentioned yesterday that is very complicated, for example, SDHP or SDHA, or some other mutations. So it's very important. So we are not only looking what is happening today, about what will happen uh, actually in the future. So with, uh, without further ado, I would like actually to talk a little bit about uh, the uh, state of the art of the pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma. Unfortunately, you know, Matt show us that they have a lot of, a lot of uh, very interesting things here. You know, you can even change the podium and everything, you know, so which is wonderful. Maybe I can go up or down. You know, it depends. You know, you know how it's life. You know, you are sometimes up, you are down, and, uh, and life is never easy. And, uh, but what I wanted to say is that um, I will not have a laser pointer. So it will be sometimes a little bit difficult to navigate you through, uh, through certain results. So I very much apologize, but you know, the laser pointer is not available or you know, the facility does not have you know, the capability of laser pointer, but I'm pretty sure that we will make uh, it happen and everything go, uh, everything go well. So um, the results I'm going to present is uh, coming, and I mentioned also something yesterday, and there will be definitely some overlap, uh, the, uh, coming not only from NIH, but uh, also from very good investigators, uh, not only in the US, but also in Europe. And uh, I will show you something about, uh, slightly about the genetics, because we will have uh, some other 
uh, very good experts today to talk about the genetics, uh, uh, then something about the imaging, and finally I will talk about some uh, uh, novel therapeutic uh, approaches that are at the beginning, but I think that they will be uh, definitely promising. And this is what we actually need, uh, some new therapeutic uh, uh, approaches. Um, the, uh, because I'm coming from the NIH, I have to uh, give you the disclosure. This is the disclosure that we have uh, the treatment with the Lutatera, and, uh, which is the lutetium 177.8, and this is happening at the NIH. So just for your information, uh, that we are working actually with these companies, and we opened the clinical trial approximately one year ago. The results are very promising, but we will see how everything will go. Um, so, as you see, you know, there is definitely continuing progress in the genetics. I will not go through everything, but you see at the beginning, in 1990s, um, we did not have, uh, or we did not know uh, so much about the genetics, but when we look at uh, the last approximately seven years, eight years or so, you can see that there are many, many genes that are actually involved in the pathogenesis uh, of the pheochromocytoma paraganglioma. I'm expecting that there will be some new genes. Of course, something is in the pipeline, whether you know it will happen or not. I don't know. I think that there are some very interesting genes, especially uh, around the Krebs cycle. The Krebs cycle is something that I will show you uh, later on that is very important, actually, because it uh, helps generate energy, and the energy is needed, actually, uh, for, um, uh, for the tissue, but also it's very important, for example, for the tumors. And uh, so you can see that in, even in 2019, right now, we have a, another uh, gene which is called the LST that came from um, Dr. Robledo from Spain. And it's again, you know, the gene that is around the, uh, uh, around this, uh, uh, Krebs cycle, so, and more is uh, expected. But it doesn't matter, you know, how many genes we have, what is important for you, how we can use those genes, actually, to predict the behavior of the pheochromocytoma paraganglioma, and how can we use those genes in the uh, therapeutic options. So, uh, right now, you uh, see we have about 22 genes, and uh, for the germline mutations, uh, the, for the FIO, it's about the, when we t take the patients with uh, these tumors, about up to 35 percent. Um, and then we have uh, somatic mutation, somatic, which means in the tumor. You know, so you don't inherit it from, uh, from your parents, but it's in the tumor. And there are some interesting mutation. And uh, I mentioned one, for example, that uh, came, you know, from uh, uh, Lauren Fishbane and Dr. Nathanson, um, the ATRX, which I think that they will be very interesting in the future, the combination. But then we have uh, also fusion genes. So when we look at the pheochromocytoma paraganglioma, believe it or not, is actually the most uh, hereditary endocrine tumor or endocrine tumors uh, uh, compared to other endocrine tumors. So, so the genetics plays a very important role, and I think that we will discover more, and uh, um, uh, we will later on talk about, you know, the study, which is under A5, and uh, together with Australian colleagues, you know, what is being done, for example, for a patient with SDHP, and I think that you will enjoy that talk later on. So um, when we look at the paragangliomas, uh, and this is the uh, uh, slide uh, uh, showing that uh, those are very close to neuroendocrine tumors, but also, for example, for uh, the gliomas or glioblastomas, as well as uh, uh, adrenocortical carcinoma, which is very interesting. So we can learn, you know, from these tumors, and very often when I'm thinking about some novel therapeutic approaches, I go to glioblastoma, I go to neuroblastoma, I go to neuroendocrine tumors and get the information. And when I get the information how they approach actually patients, then I actually trying to apply it also to pheochromocytoma paraganglioma. And you can do as well. You can uh, look at the literature, you can think about it, and there are some, some uh, patients who are sending me interesting information and ask me, would you like to try this or that? And I always actually welcome it. And you can be the part of that community and do it as well, because you will do it for yourself and for, as I said, for your relatives and for your children. So I cannot, uh, or my colleagues who are sitting over there and uh, who will be uh, giving a talk later on, 
we cannot do everything, definitely. We need your help, we need your input and uh, communication. And that's very important. Together we can make it. So, and uh, right now that there are certain signaling pathway, so it will be confusing for you and you will say, you know, well, how I can use those signaling pathway, but what is important, you know, the first ones, which is called pseudohypoxia, because this signaling pathway is very complicated and uh, not complicated in terms of the many signaling pathways around, but it's complicated for you. For you, if you have a gene from this pathway, you are in difficult situation. Okay, except for VHL, which you know has very low metastatic potential, but whatever you have around so pseudohypoxia, which is Krebs cycle or HIF signaling pathway, you will be in trouble. And you will be in trouble with multiple uh, tumors, you will be in trouble with metastatic disease, and you will be also in trouble with limited uh, treatment options. And this is why we are focusing especially on pseudo, uh, pseudohypoxia. Uh, before, you know, we thought about uh, how, what is the penetrance, what is the likelihood of patients to get actually the, um, the tumor, for example, if they are carriers of SDHB. And as I mentioned yesterday, uh, the um, view was that approximately 50, 70, 80, 90 even percent or even so everybody will get the tumor, whoever is the carrier. So I can give you the positive news that by age about 74 or so, it will be about 50 percent uh, as you see over there. But also there is another one, another study from Holland, it's approximately 40, 42 uh, percent of uh, for uh, for patients. So if I put everything together, so if you are carriers of the SDHB genes, so what is your likelihood in the future to get the tumor? I would say it would be approximately about a 40, 50 percent. That's good news. It's much better than it was a few years ago. And I was also the one who wrote several articles and said, you know, that is higher than, for example, 60, 70%. But this is how actually science is moving and evolving. And you have to correct yourself. You have to be very fair. And you have to admit, you know, this is, you know, how it was uh, before. But then you have to correct yourself in a, a, in a fair way. What is important here, and this is, uh, this is the slide here, and you cannot see it so well, but, you know, so, so look at here, and this is malignant pheochromocytoma paraganglioma, and also head and neck paraganglioma. So we saw that if somebody has a tumor, for example, the carrier developed the tumor, and what is the likelihood that they will get metastatic disease? And again, you know, we saw that that would be very high likelihood, maybe over 50%. But this is the study that came from Holland, and they think that it's uh, approximately less than 10%. That's fantastic news. That's even better, okay? So our studies are suggesting that it would be approximately 20%. This is NIH study. But NIH study is one just a study because there are some other very good study and very good investigators. So I think that needs uh, still more studies. But I would say that it would be between maybe 10% to 20, 25%. But again, we will not be uh, at the number like 50 or 70%, which is again very good for you and also for your children. Okay, so that you can tell them and they will ask you. They will not ask you when they are eight years old because they will not understand and you have to make decision for, the, for, for uh, them. And it's not easy decision to, to make, okay? You have to be very, uh, very careful because the, one day they will come to you and they will tell you why you did not tell me or why you did not do this and that because, you know, I got the tumor and you could do it every year, for example, for me the, let's say, the uh, biochemical testing. So it's very important, actually, to think about it. But, you know, you can tell them you don't have so has such high uh, chance. And some children are some more sensitive, some are less sensitive, but those that are more sensitive, and they go every day to school, and they are thinking that they can have, for example, or they have a very high chance, you know, to get uh, metastatic disease is not easy. So you can give them encouraging uh, information that is not so high that uh, we saw actually before. And uh, only just wanted to let you know that uh, there are certain mutations. I will not go through that, uh, but uh, the genetic counselors are extremely good. They have a very good knowledge these days about this disease. And they can tell you 
And if you have certain mutation, then you can have a more aggressive disease and vice versa, you can have less aggressive disease. I cannot go through that because my time is limited, but if you need something and you have a mutation and you would like to send uh, information to us or to somebody else, the, you will uh, have a very good speakers today and uh, all of them are knowledgeable. You can address me or you know somebody else you know from speakers today. That will be fine and they will be definitely happy to provide you with the, with the information. So again, it's important if the mutation may be a little bit on more aggressive side, you know what to do, for example, with yourself or with your relative or with your uh, kids in terms of uh, very good uh, uh, follow-up. So recent uh, meta-analysis, which is interesting, it's a big analysis over 700 patients and looking at the association of, uh, for the, with the metastasis. So if you have, a, for example, SDHB, that will be a definitely associated with metastatic disease and also those patients that they have a high norepinephrine and dopamine. This is very interesting. We have just new, new data, and I cannot go so much into this data, which is uh, brown adipose tissue, but if we succeed and we publish the article, so you will read about that, that we think that if uh, patients, they have a high brown adipose tissue now on the imaging, which is um, usually done by fluorodeoxyglucose, uh, and for example, together with SDHP, they have a high metastatic potential, more aggressive tumors, and of course the survival is limited. But the, uh, the article has not been uh, released yet. So for survival, on the other side, is not SDHB. Survival is, uh, survival is actually, um, they, uh, or it depends on the age, uh, because those that are uh, um, younger, they are doing better. And who are uh, uh, older, they are not doing so well. But the mechanism can be you know, different, including, for example, problem with the immune system, and of course, whether they have a metastatic disease or not, which is pretty, uh, pretty obvious. And this is you know, another risk factors for metastatic disease, and it came, you know, the first study about ATRX, uh, this was an interesting study at the time, you know, in 2004, uh, 2000, 2015, um, and uh, uh, from uh, from uh, uh, Dr. Fishbane and Nathanson in Nature Communication. You know, they're looking at the ATRX, you know, and how ATRX actually can be related to metastatic disease, and not only you know itself. So you take the tumor, you look at the ATRX, and if the patients have a ATRX, you know, the mutation, that can be, you know, more aggressive. But also they put it together with SDHB and ATRX, and I think it's working. And, you know, it was validated for, um, based on other studies, and those are, you know, the new studies that are actually showing that indeed, you know, this is the, uh, this is the, per, the, this is the problem. So in terms of actually, uh, the time when they uh, uh, develop metastatic disease or, you know, when they, for example, you know, in terms of their survival is definitely affected. And the same is, for example, telomerase activation, uh, which is uh, mainly coming uh, from the Australian colleagues. Uh, and um, we are working heavily on that uh, um, as well, together with Australian colleagues who are actually leading group actually in this, uh, in this research. So we have a new markers and we are extending the markers. Why it's important? Because if we get your tumor, we can look at your tumor. The problem is that many, not, I am not saying to this audience, but many, many patients are operated somewhere else. And they are coming and saying, you know, they, they uh, coming to NIH, coming, for example, MD Anderson, coming Mayo Clinic, coming, you know, to other universities, doesn't matter, actually. So they are saying, you know, can, I, can you help me? But we don't have their tumor because the tumor was actually not, uh, um, not safe, so we don't have a frozen tumor. So you have to really talk with your, um, I would say, um, uh, friends, colleagues, or patients, and advise them that without the tumors, we are very limited, and we will be limited. And I see it on daily basis, and the patients are coming with bad metastatic disease, and I cannot do actually, you know, very good molecular analysis of the tumor because the tumor is not available. 
okay? We, you have something rare, and if you have a something rare, you have to encourage everybody through the Facebook, through the social media. I'm not on social media. I don't read actually what you are writing there, okay? So, but you have to encourage them. Without that, we will not succeed, really. We will not succeed, okay? And uh, so, 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 which, which is very, which is very important. So sometimes, you know, we uh, are asking, you know, when to start, you know, with our children, when to start uh, uh, to uh, uh, to to do the testing, and especially for the SDHP, you can see that about age ten, and the, I would start between five and ten with the uh, biochemistry. Biochemistry is very important, and if it's normal, then around age ten, I would start with the imaging, and the imaging is either CT or the MRI, so it depends. Depends, but I just wanted to let you know that these are the guidelines that I like. Is from Dutch, uh, the uh, medical, uh, the genetics association, uh, and there are some uh, different guidelines as well. But this is my view, and the reason is because um, we have an experience with children that who develop metastatic disease at age seven or eight, and if they would uh, be uh, follow up from the age five, maybe, you know, the outcome would be a little bit uh, different. Even it's very small percentage, but the parents, they have to decide. Again, it depends how you decide, because one day, one, time, uh, one day the children will ask, uh, your children will ask you when they are 18 years old, why you did not actually put me through the testing when I was, for example, five or six years old. So it's, uh, it depends on the, on the parents and their decision. So about the imaging, of course, you know, the this is the tumor that is can be very nicely imaged, and there are two uh, main, uh, main uh, actually targets. And one target is here, you know, the norepinephrine transporter system, which I will talk about it. Another one is the uh, this one. These are somatostatin receptors, and that will be very important in the future uh, for the radiotherapy of these uh, tumors. And one uh, why for radiotherapy? One is you know it's called dotatate gallium sixty eight which is uh, available just now. It was approved by the FDA in the United States. Unfortunately, the United States was the f most likely the last country, developed country in the world, you know, that uh, got the approval for the dotatate and the pheochromocytoma. And it's very good for metastatic disease. And you can see that if we even compare with the CT and MRI, uh, whether it's SDHB metastatic or sporadic metastatic, you know, the dotatate is uh, definitely very good. So it's very important, actually, to encourage, again, your friends your, the, on the social media that if you can get the dotatate, get the dotatate, because that will give you, you know, very good view what you have, because the sensitivity is very good, and it's even better than CT and MRI. And they will try to convince you, I had whole body CT and MRI, I am fine. They can be fine in most cases, because you can see, you know, this, uh, uh, the columns are, you know, close, but it will still, dotatate will prevail and can show different tumors. Why it's important? Different tumors makes, you know, the different plan whether the patient should be operated, whether the patient should not be operated, whether the patient should uh, uh, have a certain therapy or, you know, the approach, for example, uh, 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 wait and watch and see, you know, what is going, uh, what is going on. And um, the, um, uh, this is the um, head and neck paragangliomas. And you can see that this is also very good. So if somebody has a head, neck, and paraganglioma, and if you have an uh, option what to choose, yes, MRI is fantastic, and, but you can see MRI is definitely lower than, for example, dotate. Another one which is close is uh, fluorodopa, but uh, the fluorodopa is not available in the United States except for NIH, and maybe, as I mentioned yesterday, maybe in San Francisco, I'm not absolutely, Los Angeles, I'm not absolutely sure, so, but the NIH, we have, but dotatate is available very good. Why you need it? Because you have to know what, uh, what, uh, 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 how many tumors are there, and especially in the brain. The neck, we can maybe deal with that, not easy sometimes, but we can deal. But with the brain, you are fighting for each millimeter, for each millimeter. I can, I can tell you honestly, every millimeter counts, okay? And uh, because, you know, one is growing a little bit, they, those patients have a slowing problem, are not doing well. 
Uh, they can have a, even, you know, some seizure, they can have a, some other problems, so, so it's very, very complicated. So you have to have a good, uh, good uh, picture. So, um, and uh, when we know, you know, that they, those compounds, uh, uh, they can be used not only for diagnosis, but they can, use, uh, can be used for therapy. And this is what we are calling as a teranostics. The teranostics is about the diagnostics and the therapeutics. So we, sometimes you will hear about the teranostics. I will not go into the, um, uh, the history. But uh, the history is uh, very, very interesting. Uh, only it just was pioneered by John uh, van Kauser, and uh, uh, this is a very good approach because you have a compound that, first of all, not helping you, you know, with the diagnosis. You change the radionuclide, but you use the same actually compound and uh, radiopharmaceuticals, and you put, you know, this different isotope and you change it, you know, for the treatment option. And this is very important. This is uh, like almost personalized medicine in certain way, and this is what we, what we like. Why it's important? Because, you know, there is already the clinical trial. This is for NET. NET is neuroendocrine tumor. Uh, because as I uh, mentioned yesterday, Lutatera is not actually approved for um, pheochromocytoma, paraganglioma, I mean metastatic pheoparaganglioma or inoperable one, you know, in the United States. Don't ask me why, but I think it's uh, oh, very, 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 very sad. Here, again, you can help. Okay, if you put together, you know, your forces and write some somewhere or do something, you can help. So, because it should be absolutely approved because it's approved across the world, except for the United States. And uh, it's very good, by the way, it's very good treatment. Uh, and uh, this is phase three, and you can see that uh, they use the dotatate together with octreotide, or the control only with the octreotide, and they, uh, you can see the response rate. Um, the response rate, for example, here is 18% versus 4, and uh, the same, for example, number of deaths and everything, uh, so, and progression-free survival, uh, so it's, uh, uh, at 20 months was 65% uh, versus 10%. This is big, huge uh, jump, okay? So we know that actually Lutatera is working in neuroendocrine, uh, uh, neuroendocrine tumors, and they found also that uh, there is the very good survival and overall survival. And uh, recently there was the, um, the paper that was published in JCO, yeah, 2018, that also found that Lutatera provided a significant quality of uh, um, life benefit for patients with progressive midgut uh, neuroendocrine tumor compared to high dose octreotide. This will be the same. And I guarantee you, this will be the same with the pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma because we have already some data, you know, from the NIH because we have been doing this study, you know, but under certain uh, certain protocol. This is only the study in the United States that you can get the dotatate for free. Otherwise, you can you can get the dotatate uh, uh, for pheochromocytoma paraganglioma, but uh, the, you will pay approximately one hundred thousand dollars for the treatment. Okay. And because that will be done based on you know certain certain different uh, uh, arrangement. So um, there is another one that is you know I told you the MIBG before was used. Neuro, uh, this is the noradrenergic transporter system, and this is Azedra. This is uh, you know, very interesting, and uh, the Azedra is uh, very. Um, a very sophisticated uh, actually procedure because before we used the convention uh, MIBG and when we used the convention MIBG we actually this was low specific activity so there was a lot of cold actually um, uh, molecules and there were only very few molecules that there were actually active uh, uh, so hot radioactive so when they for example the patient received the medication they received only very few molecules that they were active they were radioactive that they could destroy actually the tumor so um, uh, progenics and other companies together Mm, uh, but they develop, you know, the different process. This is ultra trace process with the high specific activity. So, which means that if you get just now MIBG, you know, everything will be 
uh, will be uh, radioactive, there will not be actually cold molecules, uh, or if there will be, that will be very, very low. What uh, does it mean? Because, you know, the treatment is very good, actually, and uh, can have an extremely, extremely good, uh, good outcome. So if you look at the radioactive treatment, as I told you, we have uh, on one side Lutatra, on the other side we have uh, the, uh, the Azedra. And Azedra is, of course, good for metastatic paraganglioma neuroblastoma, and uh, they have a, a very good uh, responses. For example, they did uh, study uh, the pheochromocytoma, and approximately 25-30% they had reduction in antihypertensive uh, uh, medication. And what is important here, for you, it's 92% of patients had partial response or stable disease. You cannot, uh, you cannot get better results. 92% is absolutely fantastic, okay? So it's, uh, that's very, uh, very unusual that you will have any therapy, even chemotherapy or other therapies, that they would have a better, uh, better results, okay? So uh, just to, to make sure, that this is uh, something exists, and what is important is actually covered by insurance, okay? And there is the website, you go into the website, they will do everything for you, there is no problem whatsoever, so you can, uh, you can be covered, doesn't matter from which state you are, you will be covered. The only problem is that you have to be positive on the MIBG, like you have to be positive on dotatate to get lutatera, you have to be positive on MIBG to get, for example, uh, azedra. Uh, so, uh, and these are the results that comparing uh, the uh, dotatate, I mean the uh, lutatera, with the azedra, um, and that's uh, the uh, response for lutatera is about 84%, but there is new study just now, so I would say about 85, 87%, and here is 92% uh, partial response or stable disease for azedra, so they are very close. So it depends, you know, what you choose, but uh, you will not be the one who will make decision what to be chosen, you will participate in dialogue and you will finally say yes or no, but you have to have a specialist who will actually guide you what is better for you and what it should be, uh, should be uh, used. So, and uh, to, to last parts of my talk about the immunotherapy, you know, these tumors are very cold, so they don't have actually the, um, uh, the uh, immune cells inside, and if they have, don't have immune cells inside, it's very complicated, difficult actually, those uh, to be treated, uh, because you know, how can you treat something if there are no immune cells? And this is why the classic immunotherapy just now that is used is usually not very good or failing, although there are exceptions, and there will be always exceptions you know, in medicine, because not everybody is, uh, everybody is the, uh, uh, the, uh, the same. But what is important, we came, you know, is the new paradigm right now is on the experimental level. And this new paradigm is called MDT, MBTA therapy. We are using so-called manambam that is attracting actually uh, the uh, cells, uh, immune cells into the tumor. And we are using so-called TLR ligands. TLR ligands, I will not go into details, but they are also <coughs> important. And why they are important? Because again, they are attracting the cells even, even more. So we get a lot of cells into the tumor. Why it's important to get those cells, like for example, dendritic cells, um, the uh, neutrophils and macrophages, because they will be fighting against the tumor cells. They will be trying to ingest them, destroy them, and present the antigens uh, on those cells. And when they present the antigens, they, uh, they, the other cells like lymphocytes, and you know something about lymphocytes, T and B lymphocytes, will get actually signal and they will start actually moving into the tumor. So we are actually helping those tumors to get the lymphocytes, but actually with uh, something that is called the MBTA therapy at the beginning. So we try to prime these tumors. You know, so to get the soldiers, and soldiers are especially T cells, but also certain way B cells, 
you know, to fight, you have to prime everything. You have to give them very good uh, conditions. You have to prepare something for them. No soldiers will fight, you know, unless you prepare them and you will give them, you know, certain environment. So we'll get the, get, get the environment and then actually they can, uh, they can fight. And these are the results, for example, in our animals. And you can see, you know, we use this immunotherapy. I will not go through, you know, how we are doing it, you know, which days and everything. But what is important, tumor volume and my survival. And we have, you know, this combination. We are using also so-called anti-CD40 because it, it's helping dendritic cells and other cells okay, actually to work even better. And you can see that the tumor volume, you know, compared to, for example, control animals, and here is absolutely tremendous, okay? I have never seen something like that, you know, so it's very, very good, uh, the, um, uh, the response of these, uh, these animals, and also the, uh, the survival of these uh, animals is very good compared to uh, 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 the, uh, the survival uh, for, uh, for other groups. So is the therapy is definitely promising, and uh, uh, we have some that they are cured, and even if we are pumping uh, millions of cells, cancer cells, they will never develop cancer again, okay? And the reason is because the T, T lymphocytes, they are also, so, uh, they have a so-called, um, not only helper cytotoxic, but they have a memory cells, and the memory cells remember, okay? And they are still circulating, they remember, remember, okay? So when you inject, you know, the cells again, you know, they, they immediately are activated, and the animals, they don't develop the, uh, the, the, uh, the tumors. And uh, we found, you know, the, the cells, you know, from lymphocytes are uh, the most important are CD8 cells, cytotoxic. So these are those that they are killing, actually, tumors. And not only pheochromocytoma, killing also other tumors. This is pretty, pretty well known. I will not go into that, but uh, this is uh, something that we are working on that because the immunity has always the, the uh, two parts. One is uh, the uh, innate immunity. This is the first phase. And the second phase is adaptive immunity. Uh, and this is uh, the adaptive immunity is uh, connected or linked uh, to activation of, uh, of the T cells and as well as uh, B cells. And uh, we are doing the, um, the experiments on uh, metastatic disease because this is important for you again and especially for those patients who have a metastatic disease. And you can see even, you know, this with, uh, with metastatic disease and you can see it here you know, the, uh, the survival is better. We are, so we still have animals that are dying because we have to optimize uh, uh, the treatment. We have some very interesting combination right now that is uh, really very, very promising. Uh, so we will see. And our goal is to move it to clinical trial, okay? And at least, you know, to mini, mini clinical trial. I can tell you honestly, because we are using innate immunity, which is non-specific. Which, and the non-specific immunity is very important because it doesn't matter what kind of tumor you have. And we have also the results, for example, for pancreatic adenocarcinoma. You know, everybody dies of pancreatic adenocarcinoma, no matter what. Or we have a for melanoma colon cancer. It works beautifully. Doesn't matter what kind of tumor you use because we are using something which is non-specific. So we prime the tumor and then priming the tumor, the tumor and the environment will make their own specific antigens, you know, for, you know, the B and T uh, lymphocytes. And the last part only, I just wanted to say, uh, don't worry, it's complicated, but I will only say that we have a new treatment option. And um, the treatment option is, you know, if you have a SDHX mutation, you know, the complex 2 is not working properly. So the complex 1 before the complex 2 is uh, uh, activated and this activated is generating something which is called NAD. 
And the NAD is very good, you know, for something which is called PARP1 or, you know, the ADP ribose polymerase. Why it's important? Because actually this enzyme is repairing actually DNA. So it's against actually your therapy, helping actually tumors and uh, the environment uh, to be everything repaired. And when everything is repaired, you know, you are unsuccessful. And we found that uh, indeed, you know, in these tumors like, you know, SDHX in patient with uh, the mutation in succinate dehydrogenase, the complex one is upregulated, NAD is higher, and uh, feeding actually this uh, enzyme and uh, you know, repairing mechanism. And this is why, you know, is the treatment is, uh, is complicated. So what we actually did, you know, so we have a temozolomide, and you know that some patients are treated with temozolomide, and sometimes successfully, and sometimes not successfully. And the reason is maybe unsuccessfully because temozolomide increase NAD. And again, the NAD goes, you know, to this repairing enzyme and repairing enzyme helping actually tumor. So we actually put together TMZ and so-called PARP inhibitor. So inhibitor of this actually enzyme. And this is over there. And we, we found, especially in those tumors that are or cells that they don't have a SDHB, it's working beautifully, okay? Because, you know, together as a synergistic effect can get us very good, uh, uh, very good results. And this is actually, especially here, where we did the study on animals, the experimental animals, and we use the TMZ and the PARP inhibitor is called Olaparib, but there are different PARP inhibitors. And you can see increase my survival, and this is really a huge increase, you know, compared, you know, if you have the separate uh, uh, approach or if you have just control animals. Why it's important? Because based on this study, and we were really very pleased, and then there, there was the study that was released, I think, one month or two months after our study from Yale University. Uh, that uh, actually re repeated or confirmed some of our results. The new clinical trial for SDHP-related paraganglioma at the NIH is going to be open and uh, will be available to our patient. And this is exactly why we should do it. You know, something very, uh, something at the bench level, but to move it actually to our patients. So. Uh, for focusing on the translational research. And there will be more that you will hear in the future. We have another signaling pathway. We are just now working with vitamin C. You would be very surprised how vitamin C, believe it or not, somebody would laugh and say, vitamin C, you know, give me a break. You know, I, I don't think that it will work very well. I can tell you honestly, for SDHB patients, absolutely beautiful, absolutely beautiful. The results are wonderful, okay? So, and you will hear about that sometime soon. Hopefully the article will go through uh, sometime soon. So we are actually dedicated to open the new uh, actually studies or clinical trials and to help all those who actually suffer uh, from this, uh, from this uh, disease. And finally, of course, I would like to thank all the members of my lab fellows, you know, all the uh, healthcare professionals and everybody, whoever is, you know, helping us because they are wonderful and they spend sometimes um, not long or enormous or endless hours uh, uh, and to help to, uh, towards those, which means patients who suffer. Of course, many things outside and, uh, NIH co-investigators and many organizations like your organization, of course you, because you are part of our community, whether we are healthcare professionals, you are patients, we are still one community. And of course, you know why, why we are here, and I like always this quote, uh, to the world you may be just one person, but to one person you may be the world. And this is so wonderful, you know, to fight for everybody because, you know, uh, sometimes we say, okay, you know, this patient has this, tell the patient that has metastatic disease. But this is not very easy because this patient has also heart, you know. This patient has also family and has his um, or uh, her relatives. And I think that we have to be uh, very, uh, very approachable, gentle, but we have to work with them in a, in a certain way and we have to understand their situation because to wake up every day with uh, 
a feeling that I have a cancer or I have a something that needs to be treated or needs to be taken um, uh, with, with, you know, some, you know, for example, they go through some procedure or something, it's uh, uh, definitely uh, not uh, easy. And as I uh, tell all my fellows, because sometimes I see good behavior, sometimes I don't see the best behavior, I always say, you know, we all will be patients. It's only a matter of time, and we should always keep it in mind. And of course, you know, my f final thank you know, to my wife, uh, uh, Michaela, who is a uh, very good support, uh, not only my wife, but uh, also my friend, I would say maybe my assistant and coach, you know, so, or so something like that, but uh, she is very, uh, very supportive and uh, Without, uh, without her and uh, being around, it would be, of course, a little bit more difficult for me to spend so many hours and effort uh, towards uh, uh, fighting uh, this disease. And I will stop here and thank you very much for your attention. It was my pleasure to be here. Are there any questions? Please. What would be the best way for a newly diagnosed patient to be accepted into the NIH program? Yeah, so if there is the newly diagnosed uh, patient uh, with the pheochromocytoma paraganglioma, the best way is to write to me. And those who uh, know me, and there are some, they know that I usually respond in 24 hours. Uh, unless, you know, I'm in the airplane, and in the airplane, you know, so the Wi-Fi is sometimes complicated, but uh, I respond pretty, uh, pretty quickly, and then I review everything, and if I feel that the patient has, for example, active pheochromocytoma paraganglioma or metastatic disease, we usually accept uh, patients. There are some exceptions that, for example, patients are treated at some very good institutions, and they were operated there, and uh, they have a good doctors, and um, sometimes they they send me information, and I will be very very fair with you. Sometimes information I would like to get the second opinion. You know, I don't believe that the doctors they know what they are doing. I don't like the sentences because if they don't know what they are doing, why they were, went you know to the, those doctors at the beginning? Okay. Of course, there are exceptions, and the exceptions are because they did not know at the beginning what they, what was going on, and of course you know they were very happy you know for you know, the treatment and uh, help, and I understand, but most, uh, most patients I take uh, to, to the NIH, so they, they write me, they, I respond and CC to my nurse practitioner, and uh, the, everything starts, but because we have a lot of patients, we have a waiting period, usually approximately two months, but I make uh, exceptions if I feel that the patient is progressing very rapidly. I take the patient very quickly even outside my clinic. And I do it practically every other week that we have some uh, urgency or emergency that we need to see the patient on, um, uh, as I said, uh, urgent basis because I feel that the patient needs uh, to have the treatment as soon as possible. But the best to write to me, and my first slide uh, show you uh, my email. So, so you can you can use that email and uh, won't be any problem, okay? How uh, I have a son with SDHD metastatic, has uh, in his twenties. How do you minimize lifetime exposure to the radiation yet still do adequate scans? Two and two of his children are SDH2. Yeah. So yeah, how do we do that with the children? That's interesting. That is the interesting question. So you have a son 20 years old, and he, uh, your son has a SDHD, did you say? And has metastatic disease. It depends on what kind of metastatic disease your son has, okay? Whether it's minimal or not. If it is minimal, of course, you know, we can make a little bit of different arrangement. But what I do usually for the children, uh, or he is already adult, 20 years old, uh, we actually suggest every three years to get the CT or MRI, but I suggest to alternate, which means CT scan, let's say he will be 23, 
he will get CT scan. When he is 26, he will get MRI. So the radiation will be only once in a six years, okay? But what is important for your son, no matter what, he should have the dotatate scan. At least the entry, the initial dotatate scan to make sure that everything fits, everything corresponds with the either with CT or MRI, whatever will be done at the beginning. And if everything corresponds with that, that we know that this is the disease, this is, you know, what he has, we can go actually from there because you, um, uh, we are very often surprised and I don't think that I saw, uh, showed that um, uh, uh, slide mm, that sometimes CT MRI shows, uh, sh they show only few tumors and the dotatate um, shows many, many more and then we have to do certain, uh, certain treatment and it's very important. We start the treatment early you know, and does not have to be chemotherapy, does not have to be even a radiotherapy. We can use uh, some cold analog, for example, which is called lanrotide or octrotide, and patients are doing on these cold analogs very well. So it's, it really depends uh, on what, uh, what he has, but I would suggest the dotatate as an entry study in terms of the imaging and then uh, decide either CT or MRI and always alternate. But has to be done every three years. If he has a metastatic disease, I stand behind it very firmly at the present time. Thank you for your, thank you for your presentation, doctor. Um, sure, is there a you. way to prevent the mutated SDHB gene to offspring? So once again, you know, your question is whether is uh, the way to prevent mutated SDHB gene uh, uh, and you mean, you know, to develop the tumor? Did you mean that? Yeah, let me rephrase that. Is sure. there a way to prevent a mutated SDHB gene, which I have, to my offspring? Uh, so it's not, uh, 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 it's, it's very complicated situation. So if you, for example, those of course they have a children, you know, so this is not the question. And uh, um, if, they, if they are, for example, young people are coming to us and they say, yes, we would like to have a children and we don't want our children to have a SDHB because we don't want to expose uh, to them. Yes, that's uh, the reproductive specialist and they can do it and we have uh, several of them actually, uh, and several patients who did it, and they have a ch children, they, they were born without SDHB, but uh, needs, to, needs to have a certain arrangement, IVF and everything. So, but it can be done. Oh, yeah, absolutely, you know. But it's ex expensive, okay? But it can be done. Hi there. Um, we've traveled from the UK, um, and we've been looking at clinical trials and things. Um, we didn't know whether uh, my husband would be able to be treated by you um, or be considered as part of a con a, um, one of your trials. Um, so, so the question is, you know, you are from outside the United States and you, uh, your question is whether, for example, the clinical trials we have, whether you can be treated, for example, at the NIH. I can yes. tell you honestly, yes, you can. You can be treated because we are working closely with NCI, National Cancer Institute. And for example, the Lutatera is done by Dr. Lin, who is the principal investigator, and I am the lead uh, uh, associate co-investigator, and uh, we actually are okay with that. The problem is only that you have to come to NIH, you know, several times, but uh, on one side you put, uh, mm, uh, mm, you, you realize that it costs maybe more than $100,000, or vice versa, you come to NIH maybe four times, five times, which let's say from UK would be maybe $800 per ticket, otherwise everything else at the NIH, internet. we can even provide you a shuttle from the airport, okay? <laughs> so which is good, okay, okay, so that's, that's absolutely, we will, um, uh, 
we will take care of you and or somebody somebody else and uh, uh, everything at the NIH in terms of treatment, also accommodation, also all the tests, also the genetics, everything is covered by the NIH, so okay. no expenses. Thank you. Thank you. We have a couple questions from our live stream folks tuning in online. Uh, what is the most successful treatment for paratumors that have metastasized to the bone? Uh. So uh, that's very complicated and difficult, but I don't think that might be, might be, and might be, uh, and this is, uh, the, we still need uh, more information. I would say if they would be positive on Azedra, so that would be one possibility. The other possibility will be Lutatera, but if I would guess in the future would be something which is called Sofigo, the ra radium 223, which is, has a very good uh, impact on patients with other cancers, uh, with the bone metastatic disease. And uh, if we succeed, and really if we succeed, that would be a clinical trial that may be open at the NIH. I still don't know, the protocol is written, but uh, we still need to put uh, certain things together. Uh, and I don't want to go into that, but uh, right now I would say Azedra and Lutatera uh, would be those two options that I would uh, choose if there is spread to bones. If there is one bone lesion, that's a different story. You can use radiofrequency ablation, cryoablation. You can use, you know, different procedure. But uh, metastatic spread to, to bones, that would, be, uh, that would be my choice at the present time. Routine surveillance scan uh, for somebody with a mutation uh, who's a child or young adult. Uh, can you comment on when one would use an MRI with or without contrast? Yeah, so so the very often is about with contrast or without contrast. Uh, this question is usually goes to radiologists, but I can tell you honestly that radiologists, they like, you know, to, to be with contrast. So you have to really think about what you want to get uh, from, the, um, uh, from, the, um, from the imaging study, and what kind of results you would like to receive. Are you coming, for example, after three years? And I said three years because, you know, to that gentleman. And uh, uh, I think that that would, be, uh, that would be in the favor of the patient uh, and if it would be, for example, my relative, I would definitely suggest to get uh, uh, MRI with the contrast, and the same I would suggest to get the CT with the contrast. Okay, CT without contrast, you know, you can trash it immediately, uh, you know, so that's no, no, definitely um, a good, uh, uh, good study, and the MRI usually with the, with the contrast. There are some, um, there, there may be some uh, 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 exceptions uh, uh, for, you know, maybe head and neck paragangliomas, et cetera, but uh, overall with the contrast, okay? So that's what we think that that uh, can be done. There are some new, actually, MRI techniques just now. Uh, there will be also PET MRI. We have a, a DNIH PET MRI. We will be doing it sometime soon, and we will decrease, actually, the amount of radiation because if you do, for example, PET-CT, let's say the dotatate is PET-CT, you know, so CT has the radiation. Not so much radiation, but there is radiation. So we will be doing, for example, PET-MRI, but needs to, uh, needs to have some adjustment and some more, more experience, and we will do it, for example, for children or for young adults. In the, in the future, but we still need a little bit, a uh, little bit more time. Good morning, Dr. Potchak. Uh, you had mentioned uh, two new developments: the MBTA possible and the NAD and PRAP. And you'd mentioned that those were going to be uh, lean towards clinical trial with SDHB. Is that going to be uh, possible to expand that out to people with other mutations, the SDHA or D or C? Yeah. So, so I think that it will be uh, uh, for the uh, PARP inhibitors, not absolutely sure, but uh, uh, can be maybe for 
uh, for some others, but we don't have a data, so I would lie to you, or I would tell, tell you something that it may not be absolutely correct, and I don't want to do it. But in terms of immunotherapy, it doesn't matter. You know, any tumor, any tumor, okay? So anything that is, uh, you know, uh, many, any metastatic tumor, we are actually uh, in a uh, good mood, but I don't know, maybe, you know, something will come up, I don't know, but we are in good mood, but that uh, this type of therapy, immunotherapy, is not absolutely uh, uh, crucial only for pheochromocytomas, slash paraganglioma, but across, you know, other tumors as well. And if we, if we prove it, that would, be, that would be fantastic. We prove it on four tumors, and the results are wonderful, but, you know, I don't know. We are working just now, for example, with my colleagues from NCI on glioblastoma, and there are also some very encouraging, uh, encouraging data, but uh, we will see. But definitely uh, for immunotherapy, yes. For the other one, we would need some, uh, some more data. I have to... Uh, uh, definitely admit that. Well, please uh, help me thank Dr. Potsdam for last time. <laughs>